Well, here it is, guys. It's the video you've been waiting on. Now we're going to replace this broken gear with a new one. All right, so this video is going to jump around a little bit. Actually, I'm recording this intro uh, as I'm getting ready to do the computer side of this. The program was written earlier, and then I made the part, and I'm coming back to go through the code and explain it to you how everything works in this. So, uh, hopefully, I'm going to try some new things in this video and really explain this to you. So uh, let's get to it and see what happens. Alrighty guys, let's do this. This is my first time doing a screencast, so hopefully this goes okay. I'm going to try to keep this as short as I can. We're going to go through all of the code in this program, because it's something I haven't done before, and I know a lot of you haven't seen it. So we're going to give it a try. I want to start off by telling you that I don't have all of these codes memorized so I have to jump into these charts they're pretty easily found online um, Akuma that's the machines that we use their uh, G codes aren't aren't always exactly the same as what some of the other manufacturers are so we uh, need to jump into these charts from time to time to look up some of the more rare uh, G codes that you might forget when you're not looking at this stuff every day. So from time to time we might need to jump over to this chart. Alright, let's get started. So the first thing we have is kind of a file name here, the dollar sign and then a file name. That's telling the machine when I send it over across a serial connection what the file name on the machine needs to be. And then the percent sign is just telling us that is uh, the beginning of the file. Now you say, well, if it's the beginning of the file, why is the dollar sign and the program name come before that? Well, that is just for the machine to, to name the file it's creating. And then the percent actually tells us the, the first of the file. And like normal, I start off with some notes. And here I'm just putting in what the file name is. This will actually show up in the program on the machine. The programmer is me, obviously. The purpose of the program is to create this worm gear. Revision 1. Nothing exciting there. The date the program was originally made, 4-17-2022. And then some a couple other notes that will could end up being useful in the future if I was to come back and need this program say two or three years from now it's just telling us the materials 4140 chromoly steel it's just some stuff to help us out in the future if we needed to refer back to it now we're going to go through a little bit of a sequence to set up the machine the first thing is a G50, and a G50 in Akuma language is just setting limits. So we put in here S1500, that's telling us that the max spindle speed is 1500 RPM. G90 is absolute mode. In machining there's pretty common to be two different modes, absolute and incremental. Absolute means that 
for instance, you start at zero and all of your measurements from that point are all off of that same zero point. Whereas the incremental, it's zero to your first measurement. And then from that measurement to the next, to the next, to the next. I don't typically ever use an incremental mode. G95 is telling us inches per revolution mode. The other would be a G94, and that'd be inches per minute mode. In this program, we don't need to do any inches per minute. So, and now uh, G00, that's a rapid movement. That means have the machine move as fast as it can. And what we're doing is having the machine rapid as fast as it can to its home position or the very beginning where it's just going to start out at. It's just kind of good practice to start your programs out this way. Well, you, you know that your defaults are set because you don't know how the machine was left previously when you were going to walk up to it. So now we're actually going to start our work. We're going to start with rough turning. And this NRT, that's just a, basically it's a name. Or a sequence name, I guess, might be a better term. And NRT, all, all of your sequence names always start with N. And then RT, I just have that for rough turn. Just something for me to remember. Next, uh, I just have this note in here to tell me that it's a CNMG 431 tool. Now we're going to go to a G96. A G96 tells our machine that it's a constant surface speed. And what that means is no matter what diameter you're at the RPM will vary so the load on the tool is always the same that's what helps you get a really good surface finish so s450 is telling us 450 surface feet m3 tells me to turn the spindle on in a clockwise direction and just choose tool number six and offset number six. G00 once again, that's our rapid movement. We're going to wrap it out to the edge of the part. We're going to stay 25 thousandths off the edge and then at a diameter of 1.7, so just a little bit larger than what our stock is. Gets us positioned quickly at the edge but without hitting the material and breaking something. M8 turns our coolant on. Then G1 we're actually going to start moving in to the edge of the material. So we're actually going to start cutting at a diameter of 1.690 and uh, we're going to establish our Z0 position off of that with a feed rate of 10 thousandths per inch. Or per revolution, I'm sorry. Now our, we have an X command here. That's telling us move at our previous 10 thousandths per revolution down past the center line 40 thousandths beyond it. And that'll make sure we clean up the whole entire front of the face of the part. Now we have a Z movement that's along the axis of the machine. And we're just going to move out 25 thousandths from the edge of the part just for clearance. And then we're going to go back into a rapid mode and wrap it up to a diameter of 1.675. Now we're going to set up a lap cycle, what Akuma calls it, or what most of the industry would call a canned cycle. And we're just going to use that to save us some programming steps. So let me go through this. G85 initializes it, or 
or tells us it's the beginning of it. NRT1. That's another sequence name. And it's telling us to use the pattern we set up, which we're going to define just here in a second. D, that's our depth of cut, and that's 200 thousandths off the diameter, or 100 thousandths depth of cut. Feed rate, 10 thousandths per rev, and then the W and the U codes are telling us how much stock to leave from what we've defined for cleanup on a finished cycle. So G81 is telling the machine to go ahead and start the cycle. So we have an X movement. It's going to do this in several passes, but we're just defining a shape here, albeit a simple shape of just a rectangle. But basically, we're going to we're going to cut vertically from the or in diameter from 1.675 to 1.450 in diameter, and we're we're going to go in towards the chuck a distance of 675 thousandths. And then that's the end of that can cycle. G80 tells us, tells the machine that that's the end. So it's going to move on to something new now. Turn our coolant off. Now you see the G00 again. That's a rapid movement. And then it's going to wrap it back to the home position. M5, that tells us to turn the spindle off. And then M1 is an optional stop. There's a button on the machine that I can push called optional stop. And you use that a lot in setting up programs for the first time. That'll allow you to say gauge apart after a cycle to know whether you need to stop and make an adjustment something along those lines you might use it for other purposes so now we're going to start our finishing once again we have a new secret sequence name and that is finish turn it name finish turn is what I've called it essentially we're going to use that same CNMG 431 Similar to before, G96 for constant surface speed. We bumped it up just a little bit to 500. Um, M3, it tells us a clockwise spindle. And then Tool 6 once again. Wrap it to the beginning of the part just like we did in the previous part of the program. I don't think we need to go over that again and move in a little slower to the edge of the part at a five thousandths feed rate that's a little bit smoother It'll give us a little thinner nicer finish turn our coolant on now we're cutting again g1 is a cut you see we have an x and a z command that's going to have us do a taper and essentially what I'm doing right here is putting a chamfer on the edge of the part make it look a little cleaner a little more professional and not quite as sharp so if you bump your hand against it, it reduce the risk of cutting you while you're doing something working with the part in your hand and we're going to cut to that 675 thousandths in again. You'll notice it's negative here. Typically, we like to start our part at zero and then a negative always tells us that we're cutting. It isn't always the case, but most generally it is. 
once we get to the 675, we're going to stop and we're going to move up or out from the material to a diameter of inch and a half. Turn the coolant off with an M9. And once again, let's go down here on our chart. Here's our M8 and M9. Go back home again with rapid movement. Turn the spindle off. Optional stop once again. In case we needed to measure something before we're moving on to the next part or next operation. So our next operation is grooving. That's where we're going to put a relief in for a couple reasons. One, because the part needs it. And two, it gives us a place for the threading tool to stop at the end and not just try to end in solid material. So our little name again, our sequence name, end groove. We just have a note that our tool is 156 thousandths wide. That comes in useful when I'm doing some math to figure out where I need to be cutting. Your points are at the left side of the tool and a lot of times you're cutting with the back side or the right side of the tool. So you need to know this offset number. Once again, G96, constant surface mode at 400. These grooving tools are quite a bit more fragile, so I've slowed it down a little bit. M3 for clockwise, and it's tool 8 in the turret. Wrap it into the beginning of the part again, just like we did in the other operations. So next, we're going to go ahead and wrap it in to our, our point in the z-axis or along the length of the, the shafting. And that's going to set us up for our cut, which, okay, we're going to turn on our coolant and start our cut. And it's going to move into the edge of the material. and then uh, go ahead and cut down to a diameter of 1.2. That happens to be our, our diameter we need at the bottom of the groove for this gear. And we're only going to use a feed rate of 2 thousandths per revolution this, this time. Going a, quite a bit slower because that tool, it's pretty fragile and this 4140, it, it's hard material. And then once we hit this diameter of 1.2, it's going to wrap it out quickly back up to 1.7. And it's going to move over with another Z movement and make another plunge back to our 1.2. A lot of repeti repetition in this. Same codes over and over. Wrap it back out to the 1.7. Now we're going to move back towards the right hand side of the machine, position ourselves, come down to the edge of the material, now you see the typo there, that should be a Z, we have an X and a Z movement. That's going to give us a, a taper. We're chamfering the back side of the edge of the gear now with this movement. Screwed myself up a little bit. I'll have to come back and fix that. And now we're going to move down to that 1.2 measurement again, diameter. 
and then move the tool across the bottom of that diameter just to kind of clean it up and make it a little smoother. Once we get to that point, we're going to wrap it out, turn the coolant off, and go back home. Turn the spindle off. And now we're ready for our threading, which symbolizes in here with our sequence number thread or name. Now this time you notice we started with a G97. A G97 simply just tells it at a, a specific RPM to run at. We've chosen 100. And I can tell you I've already, in the final part, I adjusted this to 75. M42, that's our gear range. On these accumulates, we have an M41 for gear for low gear, an M42 for high gear. So this is actually wrong. This needs to be an M41. And in the real program, it got adjusted once again. These are the things that you find out as you go along. You think, oh, this will work good. And then you test it, and something happens, and you have to come back and change it. M3, that's telling us that it's a, a clockwise rotation or normal rotation that you're used to with a lathe. And then M8 turns our coolant on once again. So now we got to figure out our leads. So here's where all the math comes in. And there's a bunch of it that's very tricky. It took me several tries, actually, to figure it out. So we're going to come over here to Notepad. Our pitch. Our pitch is six threads per inch. And I figure that by taking my calipers and adding up how many threads be coming in an inch. In this case, it was only a half inch, and I had three threads in that half inch. So we double that and get six, six threads per inch. And I'll see if I can get a picture put up of what that looked like with the calipers. Then we need to go and look at our gear and see that it had seven leads or seven starts. Now most most threads you're used to seeing is just a regular bolt with just one start. In this particular case we have seven and that starts getting into some of our gear theory that's probably a little beyond the scope of this. So we need to take these to figure out our lead. So first thing we need to do is translate our six threads per inch into how many thousandths that is per thread. And we do that by saying one inch divided by six gives us a number of 16667. I'm just going to round that off. Now we take this 1667 and we can use that to figure out what our lead is. We can do that two ways. We can simply say 7 divided by 6 gives us a lead of 1.1667. 1 or the other way we could do that is our number of threads per inch multiplied by the number of leads. So 
if we take our 0.1667 and multiply that by 7, we roughly get the same number. One six six nine. One six six seven times seven. Or like I showed before, seven divided by six. Two tenths of a thousandth isn't going to really affect us. So we need to know all these values here to move on. Come back to our program. We're selecting tool 5. That's our threading tool. And we're going to wrap it to the beginning of the part. 50 thousandths out from the edge of the part. That 50 thousandths is going to be kind of important to us. We're going to have to keep that number in mind. And you'll see why here in a second. The other thing is we want to start outside of the part just a little bit. So we're not crashing the tool immediately when it gets there. A G71 is our actual threading cycle. So the X 1.250 is our diameter, our depth of how of what our thread is going to be. We're going to go in, cut in 625 thousandths, and that's going to end us in that groove that we just created with our grooving tool up here, and then pull out and move back. Our retract height is also going to be this number here. It's going to cut down to the 1.25 in many, many, many steps, and then retract back to the 1.49, and then move back out to the 50 thousandths. All right, so our H code. Our H code helps us determine where the first thread cut is going to start. So we take our inch and a quarter, add our 150 thousandths to it. So that's going to start at 1.4. And then this depth of cut measure value here so we take that 1.4 and subtract 15 thousandths. So our very first pass is going to be at 1.385. This B value, typically this B value is going to be 60 for 60 degree uh, profile in a, a normal thread. If we're using an Acme tool and an Acme thread, which are 29 degrees. Interestingly enough, half of 29 degrees would be 14 and a half degrees. And our pressure angle of our gear tooth is 14 and a half degrees. So now we have an F value of our lead, which brings us back over to here. That's why we needed to know this. Our J value tells us to move one revolution per 
one inch, 166, seven. This math gets really, really confusing. And in fact, you're going to see it in the video. I had the math wrong on the first several tries. Turns out 6 divided by 7 and 7 divided by 6 are not the same thing. Anyways, back to the learning. M22, we need to go back to our chart and look at that. Just telling us chamfer off. That doesn't really even matter in this particular application, but it's there. M75 is our end feed pattern. This is something interesting on an Akuma. I, I would assume other manufacturers do this too. A lot of you out there, you're fairly familiar with threading on a manual lathe. You typically only cut on the left side of the tool. Well, Akuma is giving us an option to cut on the left side of the tool, the right side of the tool, or alternating between the two. Make one pass on the left, one pass on the right, and back and forth. Kind of evens out tool, tool wear. And we can look that up on our chart. Actually, I got that backwards. M75 is our uh, thread cutting pattern. And what that is, is the pattern which the machine decides how much to reduce the depth of cut per each pass. Remember, we said our first cut's 15 thousandths deep. 15 thousandths minus from the 150 thousandths, yada yada. So the first time it's going to be 15 thousandths, the second time might be 12 thousandths, the third pass might be 10 thousandths, and it's going to get less and less and less and less each time. Or it might be you set it for 15 thousandths, 10 thousandths, 5 thousandths. One thousandths, one thousandths, one thousandths until you're done. The M33 is choosing our zigzag pattern or cutting, alternating between left and right, left and right. All right, on to lead two. So here's some more math for us. So we need to take our pitch number up here and add that onto our 50 thousandths here to start the next pass. So we take our 50 thousandths and add 0.1667, which gives us 2167. What that's doing is offsetting our start point of the carriage or the turret or the tool. And this is where our, our offset becomes between our, our differences in thread start. You could achieve this same thing on a manual lathe by setting your compound parallel to your shaft material or, or parallel to the axis of the machine. And then move your compound 166, 7, either towards or away from the chuck. and create your offset in that way. And what really is happening is you have a trigger point at which 
the carriage or the tool starts moving on a manual lathe, that would be closing the half nut. On a CNC lathe, that would be more of a trigger point where the spindle comes back around to zero degrees or whatever degree number the machine chooses to start at. Essentially, this line is exactly the same as what it was before. And then we'll head on to lead number three. 3834. How did we get that number? We took the, the last offset number and added 1667 to it again. And essentially, we're going to keep doing that. Until we get to all seven leads. You'll see that this G71 line is identical to the other two and it's going to keep being that way throughout the rest of the, the threading cycle. You see our next offset 5501. type something in wrong there. 5501. So I don't know if I was real clear on this or not. By moving further away or further towards the chuck, whichever the case may be, you need to be the same each way. You need to keep adding in the same direction. And what's happening is the, the stock has more time to rotate from the time that it's either the carriage is triggered or the half nut is engaged. And it's very precise to give us our offsets to get our different tooth starts. So once again, we add 166.7. I don't know. Something's not adding, working right on this calculator. 167. 716.8. 1, once again. Just like before. Our next lead, 8835. I don't know why there was a point there, but there was. Then our very last value, our seventh lead, one inch, fifty thousand, two tenths. And then our threading pass again. We get there, we turn turn the spindle and the coolant off, and send it back home. We've seen those before. New code force here is M2. And that just tells us the program's over. And then another percent sign. And that's just telling when it's sending the, the program over across serial that that's the end of the file. So uh, hopefully that gives you a good outlook on a whole entire CNC program. A lot of this is... is very similar to a manual machine the difference is every single move that you're going to make you're 
you're thinking it out ahead of time in your head and writing it down on paper, essentially. You're creating a set of instructions to follow, and you're doing it in a, a way that the computer inside the machine can understand. Really, it's the same as running a manual machine. It's just pushing, pulling the levers and tightening the clutches for you. And you get to stand back and watch and wait for bad sounds and hit the button to stop it if something don't sound right. So hopefully this is a, a pretty good overview for those of you that's new to the CNC world. Give you an idea that, hey, this isn't so bad. And, hey, other guys make mistakes too. Nothing is perfect on the first try. We're all always constantly learning. That's what I want you to take from this. So let's kick it over to the machine we'll actually start making a part. Let's do it. Well, we're at the lathe now. I've already made a couple uh, practice pieces. They didn't come all, uh, all that great. But I think we're ready to try one and see if it works. This is still just another practice piece. Want to test it in this soft aluminum before we went for the real stuff. I got this piece of 4140 chrome molly to make the gear out of. But I thought I would film this all the way through for you guys. On the soft aluminum, I'm going to run it with the door open. Probably not exactly a recommended practice. But I wanted you guys to be able to see it. And I can run it aluminum without coolant. So that won't be spraying all over the place. So let's give it a try. I got this stopping after every part of the program so we can review it a little bit. Hopefully that's light enough you can see it. Roughing pass. It goes home. You do that for two reasons. One, if we were setting up a big production job, we could come in here and check this make sure our diameter's right and then two we could either run the same tool or we could switch to another tool for a different kind of finish but we're just practicing and this isn't critical or anything so we're just gonna let it go with the same tool finish pass. Next what's going to happen is this grooving tool is going to come in here and it's going to cut a relief right here for us. Now it went home. Next we'll switch to our threading tool and start making passes on the threading. I paused you for a second while I uh, 
took that little burr off. Now we're ready to start threading. Well, that idea didn't work. Broke the insert. Go ahead and let the program run out. All right, I made an adjustment in the program. Restarted it. It's a slow process, guys. All right, so here we go. That's our first first lead or our first thread. Six more to go. I think from now on out I'm going to speed this up quite a bit because that takes a while. That was over two minutes to do one. They're going to get slower from here on out.
would appear as though the insert broke again. Might as well stop you guys. Alright, so you fellas can see broke the tip off that insert. So, in the tests before, I didn't break anything. So, of course, when you turn the camera on, things break. I don't think we're going to continue with this tool. I have this other tool here. It's a lot heavier duty. Problem is that it's a little too wide. So, this is carbide. Uh, I'm going to have to see if I can turn that down or grind that down on a, a green wheel. This is a lot heavier, so it should be able to handle it a little bit better. Well, fellas, hopefully this is enough to give you an idea how this works. It's a long, slow process. Well, hopefully you learned something from this. We'll keep trying. Hopefully I can use what I got here to get you guys a video. It's been a couple weeks, so you guys need something. Hey everybody. I wanted to show this real quick. I think we have a successful test. Well, after this successful test, time to make one out of some 4140 chrome molly steel. Something I forgot to mention a little bit ago was uh, we were going through the charts. Sometimes the, the charts don't tell me enough, and I actually need to go back to the Akuma books and get more detail on how something works. That said, let's kind of start wrapping this video up. It's getting extremely long. So what I got here, here's our broken part, and then each iteration of test piece I went through until I got it right, from bad math and breaking tools, we got five tries before we got to this guy here. All of these test pieces were just soft aluminum, cheap, and then we went for the big money, 4140 chrome molly. That said, I hope you guys learned something, and I had one other thought. Put this down in the comments. I don't know if we're going to do this or not, but would anybody be interested in a giveaway of my screwed up test pieces? If, uh, if there's some interest in that, maybe we'll uh, come up with some kind of drawing or some sort of a giveaway. That may not happen if, if it's too big of a deal. And uh, probably have to keep that to the U.S. states. Uh, something to think about. I hope you guys learned something. 
So that's pretty much going to do it for this one. Yeah. That was a long one. I hope I didn't lose you all. But uh, down in the comments, let me know if you liked it. Let me know if you learned something. And let me know if we need to do more videos just like this. Because uh, there's a lot to it. Check back for more clay track work. Thanks a lot, guys.